Good morning. My name is. Oh. <laughs> this one. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle Hikoinen. Uh, I'm professor at Serada Center for uh, Educational Research and Academic Development in the Arts from uh, University of the Arts Helsinki. My background is in uh, dance educational studies and dance research. And I'm currently also a uh, vice director of Arts Equal Research Initiative. I'll talk about that a bit later. Hi, I'm Alex Coulter. I'm director of an organization called Arts and Health Southwest in the Southwest region of England. I also provide the secretariat for an all party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being, and I'll be talking about that today. Um, I'm Nancy Hay. I'm director of an organization called the What Works Center for Wellbeing. Uh, and we're a knowledge broker organization between academics and policy and practice. We're relatively new um, in the UK and we're quite small, but uh, we my background previously was in the policy making side. And so I spent the last 15, 20 years from the policy side. How do you use evidence in policy making from the, the the practitioner side and so I'll bring a bit of both of those views and we've been looking specifically at well-being but also on arts uh, um, and a whole range of other issues on well-being as well which I think someone said something around about sustainable development which is a similar concept a very broad one so I'll hopefully pick up on some of those questions as well okay so uh, we're going to ask each speaker to speak for about 15-20 minutes um, Nancy would you like to go first given that your slides are already yeah, I think I might yeah. need to swap places, though. Yeah. And then maybe use this mic for that for the presentation. Bring my chair a little bit. So I've brought pictures with me. And the reason I've brought pictures is because um, sometimes pictures are easier than words. And we know that from research. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is evidence in policy and practice. And you can find more about our organization on the website there. And we do a lot on Twitter, which I'll talk about in this conversation as well today. Um, let's see if I can get this going. So I'll talk about the What Works Center for Wellbeing. Um, we are an independent, collaborative organization set up to develop our own and share robust, accessible, and useful evidence about well-being. And I won't go into well-being in this context, but it's, if you want a well-being 101, I could do that as well. Um, but we're aiming to improve well-being in the UK um, and reduce well-being inequalities. And we develop and share, well, it's, that's quite big in terms of improving well-being, lots of people can do that. Our job in that is, to is, the, is the evidence bit. So I'm very geeky on that. Um, and we believe that well-being is the ultimate aim of what government does and ultimate aim of what the charity sector does, what philanthropy and community action is. We're part of this thing called the What Works Network, so there's a number of other organizations in social policy who also work in the way that we do. Um, and we are funded by the research councils in the UK, so research funders, um, about eight or nine different government departments, and that's quite important when, to some of the questions that you were asking earlier. Um, and also by a number of businesses which are down there. Um, so our chairman was from British Telecom, which is a, a big uh, business in the UK. He's the chief medical officer there. And the National Lottery, which is a charity sector organisation. And then we work with 18 universities across the UK and actually in Finland, um, to bring, led by these four universities. So we work with a large number of, of academic organisations. And it's a new type of organization. We're kind of testing it out. Um, I also worked for 15 years in policy. So, um, and I worked particularly at the end setting up the policy profession in government. So I'm going to start with that side just so that you can see where I came to it as. So one of the best drivers for knowledge use is professionalism, being good at what you do. And when we were talking about what policy officials do, so policy is what government does. Um, it can be very, very high level, like what direction we're going to do, how we're going to spend money, but it can also be quite operational of like, okay, how do we organize, um, how we deliver 
the housing benefit. It can be quite specific. Um, but one of the things that we agreed as the senior policy officials across government, so I worked with the senior ones, to understand what policy is and what skills you needed to do it. And we think good policy making is bringing together the evidence, the politics, and the delivery. So how you like the delivery is the, the whole system that makes it happen. And really good policy making brings together those three things. Policy making is essentially problem solving in the political context. And one of the one of the big challenges when we set up the policy profession was that we saw 30 different policy models very few of them, maybe one or two included politics and ministers and parliament. And that is just wrong. That's the whole context of which we're working in. So there's a whole bit about being a policy official that is about understanding and working with politics and democracy and the systems of government. And this is a skill set in itself. Public affairs people often do this as well. Um, and then there's a whole skill set in making things happen through the systems of government and through systems that government interacts with through regulation and other things that it does. Um, and you need all to be aligned. And then there's the bit around evidence. And evidence in policy making, one of the questions was about um, how do you assess evidence from all sides? So I thought this was particularly interesting. So when you're a policy official, you get evidence sent to you by loads of different people. Um, it could be a, a charity advocating for a particular thing. How do you assess that? And actually, politicians will also come with their experience from their constituents, which is actually evidence of a sort as well. But there's lots of different types of evidence within there. So it's understanding the history of your policy area, um, understanding who the key players are. But the four sites, the horizon scanning, science and technology, how that impacts your, I and mean, often policy will change because, not because of anything government does, but because of an innovation in the industry. So there's a fantastic book called The Box about how the container, development of the container, completely transformed the whole of the shipping industry. And it completely transferred the nature of work in that sector and everything else. And that didn't come from government, that came from an innovation in the sector. The economics, which I'll come to in a bit, because actually that's one of the bits that's often missing, um, and statistics and data analytics. So I think we need to look at evidence in the round. And I came at it from going, how can we best use evidence in policy? So the UK, um, I think, is a world leader in science advice to policy. And this is um, an article around... This is a, so we had the policy profession, the government science and engineering profession, the research councils, and what, all coming together to say, actually, science and evidence is important in policy making, and we're going to work together to do it better. So there's an article in Nature around it. And we, want to, we need to use evidence very broadly, and we need to involve people from a broad range of disciplines. And how do we do that? Well, evidence synthesis has a really crucial role, and we know that from health in particular, where evidence synthesis has been used really effectively to understand it. Um, and collaboration, that bringing people together to have decision-making on really solid stuff rather than opinion, which is what often social policy is around. So that's why it was a really fantastic statement in June this year around the importance of evidence synthesis in particular, and that's what the What Works Centres focus on. So when I'm thinking about evidence, evidence to me, and as a policy official, is feedback. It's just information. There's different types of evidence, different types of information that we use to learn and improve what we do. And a What Works Centre is an organisational and system-wide approach to learning. Um, and the type of evidence you need for a policy or a practice decision depends on the level of risk you're taking, and it depends on where you're starting. So this is an example of one of the organisations looking... This is the education one looking at the impact, the evidence quality and the cost for various types of things you can do to improve academic attainment. Um, and, and that's fine. I mean, the idea is not to do any harm first, right? <laughs> and then move on to work out how you can do what you do better. So I'm going to also talk about when I set up the, the, evidence, the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, I was struck by the evidence the knowledge base around how you use evidence in policy was very much from an academic perspective and it didn't reflect any of the stuff that we were doing in policy making to really use evidence in policy making so I was like well we need to understand what the evidence base is here so we did a, a systematic review so we did three things actually we did a scoping systematic we did two a scoping review and a systematic review to identify mechanisms by which knowledge use happens 
Um, and so there was a, a detailed report. We did a summary report, just giving, showing you this, because this is kind of the sorts of process that we go through in practice, showing our working. We identified six mechanisms through which knowledge use happens. We also looked at behavioural insights and how people's um, behaviour affects knowledge use. So we looked at this particular model, which is capability, motivation and opportunity, and how those interacted with the mechanisms we'd identified. Um, and so this was something I'd used in policy a lot. So we had the six mechanisms, which I'll go into a couple here, are championing evidence-informed decision-making, which is what that article was about. Evidence is good. We should do more of it. Not particularly effective, actually. And there's not a lot of evidence around it. But it's meant to make you feel motivated to do it and to potentially give you permission to do it as well. And um, our, given the low evidence base around it, we, we don't do a lot of that, but we use it in combination with other things. The other one was about defining good evidence with the community, um, saying what is what does good mean? Uh, again, there's not a great deal of evidence around that, um, and we but we do do it quite a lot in the well-being area because the evidence quality is quite low. So someone was also asking about what you do when the strength of the, the knowledge base in the area is quite low. Well, actually, you work out what does what what is good knowledge in different types of ways. Um, uh, and you do applied research, you do conceptual, you do scoping, you look at different ways of understanding it. Mechanism three was about visible evidence through access and communications. And this is about... Um, making it easy to understand. <laughs> so often excellent research is happening, but if I work in a different sector, why would I know about it? And I love well-being. I love well-being science. It's my job to read academic papers, and yet I still have a stack of them on my desk that I haven't read because I haven't got time to read it. And if, I'm, if it's not my main job, I'm not going to do it. So something about making that robust evidence, which is a must, accessible is really important. There's very good evidence around that, and we've focused on that, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And then the interaction between decision makers and researchers. So just having a getting people together, building those networks. And there's some really good examples. I think in the report that was sent around earlier, I had the Centre for Evidence and Policy at Cambridge University. So you build those networks. And they're, they're, they're good. We, we haven't done a lot because actually it costs quite a lot in terms of time and effort for the reward. And so we focus on slightly more cost-effective works. But not to say it doesn't work, but it's not the one we've focused on. And then the only mechanism that works in to improve capability as well as motivation and, opposition, motivation and opportunity is learning. And so we've done quite a bit around learning um, as well. So actually teaching people about the evidence and how to build evidence itself um, and made that learning as easily accessibly available. So we've, we've used the mechanisms of combination. And the last one is mechanism six, which is adoption through decision-making structures and processes. So this is about motivation and opportunity, but making it as easy as possible to use that evidence. So for the healthcare system, this is, includes things like when you're a doctor in your surgery, you've got a patient, you type it in and it puts the evidence up on your screen about it. That's, that's a, adopting in the processes. We, the What Work Centres themselves are a structure for use of evidence, um, and we're, we're testing that now. But there's lots of other ways that we'll do it. I'll talk a little bit about those, and that's very effective in terms of reaching people quite a, a long way. And I think that's where we, we fit in. So um, this is mechanism six. So I'll talk about adopting through structures. So the, the What Work Centres themselves are around improving the quality of evidence use in social policy. Um, social policy is particularly tricky because we all kind of have experience of it. We know somebody who has this experience. My experience of going through school is this. And, that, and the politicians themselves will also have their best view of it. And actually, this is where we need evidence best, just to check out those assumptions. And what we assume isn't always true. So these... The What Works Network is about nine or ten organisations, and there's a number of affiliated ones who run on the similar sort of principles. And the aim is for unbiased, rigorous, concise research. Um, um, we do a lot of systematic reviewing, and we do a thing that's about translating evidence. So someone was asking about the challenge in translation. A lot of what government analysts do, and social research do, is making sense of that evidence for the audience. 
And that's actually a role. <laughs> so someone was asking about what academics can do, actually know their strengths in their academics and partner with people who can translate stuff and make it available to their audience. Um, and that actually is quite time consuming to make it relevant and understandable. Um, and then identifying and fill the evidence gap and incentivizing people to generate and use evidence and make it cool, make it interesting, make it exciting, want it a place for people to work that is really rewarding and, and builds the careers. Like getting cool people to come and work is one of my success measures, right? Um, in a, the other thing we do in terms of mechanism six, so this is the central guidance for government analysts on appraisal and evaluation. Um, so this is the, the green book um, that's used by the Treasury in the UK. And so one of our wins early on, someone was asking for an example, um, the Green Book recently changed to, uh, to say that the purpose of economic appraisal is, is around principle of well, welfare economics. So this 2.3 at the top. That is how government improves social welfare or well-being. So that all well-being was the new bit <laughs> referred to in the Green Book as social value. And that's exciting because we've got it in the systems and structures that actually well-being is okay to use. There is a good enough science behind it to use well-being evidence in your choosing your objective for policy making, deciding what your options are, how you select your options, and how you evaluate impact. Um, and so that was quite a big win, working with the key players in terms of the system to change it. But again, that's a mechanism to change it. Um, the other one mechanism that we focus quite heavily on is about awareness, engagement, and impact, i.e. communications. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about this, because this is the one that I think we could just do so much better from the evidence perspective. Um, so it's not about um, sensation. So um, I don't know why, oh, over-egging it. That's why the eggs are there. So there's a phrase in England about over-egging something. So this sensational headline, because often your press team, I don't know if it's the same here, but the press team will be like, this amazing research will transform everybody's lives. Mm. Actually, often science isn't about that. It's like, oh, we found this quite interesting thing, or, or we found a nil result. Like, actually, that's really important. We found this didn't work, or we didn't find any effect. Actually, in the loneliness research, one of our big findings was that there was only a little bit of impact from most of the things that were done, or from the way we were currently doing it and understanding it. So avoiding that sensation in the communications that we're doing. There's a, there's a role for that headline-grabbing stuff, but that's not what we do. The other, the other thing is I get criticised is that when I, it's getting, we use Twitter a lot to communicate and it's really effective. We use blogs as well to communicate. They are really effective. Um, and getting research into 140 characters or 500 words is really hard to do when it's your life career job. And what I will often do is summarise a whole body of knowledge in one bullet point, <laughs> one tweet. Um, but it's a gateway into the research, right? Um, all of this is a gateway into the research. Um, but yeah, this is my joke from the New Scientist about it. <laughs> but but my, my, my serious point is Twitter, blogs, social media, LinkedIn, really effective at sharing work. Networks we've found to be incredibly helpful. So we put quite a lot of effort into testing. We do... Um, we do A-B testing on our emails, like the wording of our emails, what goes into the heading, what gets more opens, what gets more clicks, all of that thing, as you would as a media organisation. And it's incredibly cheap to do. You just need the skill set. Um, and that's not hard to learn because it's new and everyone's learning it. But yeah, so that, that is really effective and it's been shown to be effective. But um, yeah, there is a little bit about like all my work in that. The other thing is about public engagement. So... This is other types of activity, but it's working out what's relevant for you. So there's lots of articles around happiness and things. So is that something that we need to do as our organisation or is somebody else doing it? There are a lot of books around well-being and happiness. This is just a selection from my bookshelf. So do we need more of those? And that's one way of communicating science quite effectively. And you can see they're very popular, as though I wouldn't be more of them. And then this is... Um, one that was done by one of our partner organisations around called Action for Happiness, um, which has brought all the research together about what you can do as an individual. So very much a public-facing audience rather than a, 
uh, rather than a policy audience, is about what can you do as an individual and summarising all of that science into 10 things that feel quite simple and can be communicated quite easily, which is another step on from what we would be doing. But it depend I think my key point here is it depends on you who your audience is as to how you do it, because this all is time intensive and can be costly, so you need to pick out what, you, what do you think is going to be most cost effective in your, in your engagement. So we focused on getting things as simple as possible, accessible as possible, and communicating for interested, intelligent, non-experts. So we focus on those sorts of things. We look at the quality of it, so how much knowledge is known, how, how confident can we be with the various findings. So, and this is the same as you would use in healthcare. So this is the, the grade mechanisms. We, look, we do a short summary, a briefing, the, what's the big picture? Why should you care about this? What did we find? What are the evidence gap and how, what you can do with it next? Um, and actually, interestingly, the, the, the policy and practice people don't really care about how you found it or why. They care about what can I do with it. They're already in this space here, that bottom bit of the briefing. We also do conceptual stuff uh, and trying to work out how things work, which is bringing in the qualitative evidence and using that in effective ways. And then we try and compare the sorts of things that you could do, their impact on well-being, how much it costs, how confident can we be in a sort of toolkit. And we can't, it's hard to do for well-being, but that's what we've tried to do. Um, but also that means so that, that graph in the middle with the people is from a conceptual review. So there's different types of academic work that can be translated in different ways for different purposes. And that's quite important to remember. What is it you're trying to do? What type of work are you doing? How, what, what impact can you have with that type of work? Uh, make it easy as possible. I'm happy to share these slides. Um, and the other thing we do is we work with, so I've called this teamwork for dissemination. We work with people who do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So we worked with the statistical office in the UK with and local authorities. So this is the local council. I don't know what the equivalent is here. To bring together the current information about well-being, which is what we bought, with the current statistical information and measures around well-being that are available, and then what was useful in a local authority to develop a set that is helpful. So this is where an event has a particular purpose to test out findings rather than just getting people together for the sake of it. And so you can see that we built a product together, they're applying it in their organisation, so we're working together to do something. And teamwork, we know, improves, can improve performance. So this is an example of our impact. So it's all very well having your research evidence, but unless you've built the audience beforehand, you spend a lot of time just going, hey, I'm here. So we did a lot of thing about building awareness. Um, and most people don't, won't know you exist. And then they go, oh, hello, you're there. And that's the awareness bit. And then they get interested. So they might... I don't know, share you on Twitter or follow you on Twitter, or they might do the next thing. They might come along to a meeting. They might um, do a whole load of different... So we do course and events. We have particular groups that we work with who are particularly interested organisations. And we also do one-to-one -one conversations with key people because that's a different way of, of getting change and advice and things like that. So reaching a large number of people. And then the types of action that you'll see change as well. I just wanted to summarise the sorts of things that we do and the evidence base for it. Um, and I hope I've picked up most of your questions within that. But I'm really excited by the questions that you asked. And I wanted to learn from you as well. Yeah? No, I haven't. No. Yes. Well, it's great to follow Nancy, actually, because I think I come in somewhere in the middle of all that, and I'm by no means an expert in either evidence or policy, but I have been exposed to it in my recent working life, and um, my background is much more in practice. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today particularly about an inquiry, um, and there are some of these reports, if anyone wants to reference one, um, that we did with the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being, and how that has um, attempted to influence policy and how evidence was used in that process. Um, so this inquiry was led by this all-party parliamentary group, which I'll refer to as the APPG, 
Um, APPGs in in the UK Parliament are groups of parliamentarians from both houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and from all parties. Anyone can come into them and they have a, an apolitical role in that sense, or a cross-party role. And they're politicians who come together around a particular area of policy interest and work, work together for a sort of common cause. Um, so this particular APPG was founded by Lord Howarth of Newport, who is a Labour peer, uh, and in 2014. And our current co-chair is Ed Vasey, who's a Conservative MP who was Minister for the Arts until relatively recently. In 2014, the NHS in England published something called the Five Year Forward View, and that brought to the foreground prevention as a major um, new direction of travel, if you like, in, in terms of healthcare. And it seemed a very timely moment for the arts and health field to try and influence the medical establishment, influence policy directions in that context of the, the new emphasis on prevention. And uh, I would say that a lot of the work we've been doing is part of a much bigger shift in the way people think about health. So what we sometimes call a healthy and health-creating society, a move from a more illness-based health service, which is quite hospital-centred, to the notion of a people-centred, um, healthy uh, way of living. And I think a lot of the work that the arts and health sector does fits very well into that, that concept. And so it's been very helpful to be part of what is a much bigger movement, if you like, and is sometimes characterised as a social movement. So um, the inquiry started in 2015 and was funded by two major trusts, the Wellcome and something called the Paul Hamlin Foundation. We had academic partners, the Royal Society of Public Health Special Interest Group in Arts, Health and Wellbeing and King's College London. And we had an advisory group with many academics in it, including Norma. So Norma's been involved in this inquiry all the way through. The process that we used was based in Parliament, and, and I just say that from my perspective coming in as an outsider and um, doing the, being the secretariat from an outside organisation, the power of that building, the power of Parliament, is one of convening primarily, so it has pull. So people will come into the room who wouldn't necessarily listen to the practitioners in the field, uh, and they'll almost just turn up just because it's the building and the people hosting it, rather than necessarily because they, they are convinced by the subject under discussion. Um, so that is a real power which I think um, we can use and um, we had a process of round tables so we had 16 round tables over two years and the round tables were based on a quite instinctual sense of what was most relevant in our field which is massive broad ranging and quite amorphous so in my mind it was around an area of practice that was flourishing there was enough of it that we could talk about it where the evidence base was growing or relatively good and where there was a kind of policy receptiveness so there was so I always use dementia in the arts as the best example of that it's an area of policy where there was a lot of there were a lot of challenges the health service was really looking for help for solutions the arts sector was very engaged with interventions around dementia and there was an, enough interest in it that there was a growing evidence base. So that was a good subject to bring people uh, around the table on. And um, there were always academics, artists, health professionals, arts professionals, uh, policy makers, commissioners, uh, and most importantly, service users in those conversations. So that was a very sort of 360 degree way of looking at a subject. And I was interested that Nancy was talking about this in the round way of thinking about evidence. It certainly wasn't about pure academic evidence in its traditional form, but I think you could argue that all of those voices were very valid in that discussion. That was then backed up by um, research. We had a research her, Dr. Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt, who is based at King's College, and she was doing uh, research into the theory, the evidence base, and also there was a big call for practice examples, and around 196 practice examples from across the country were submitted, which was submitted within an evaluation framework, also written by Norma, the Public Health England Arts and Health Evaluation Framework. 
The, the um, conceptual basis for the report, the big report is a pretty chunky document, uh, is the social determinants of health and well-being. And the, the first chapters are around the social determinants, around the evidence base, around policy commissioning and around place, environment and community. Then it goes into the life course. So then it's young people, working age, adulthood, older age and end of life. And I think that was a good decision because actually that mirrors the way that a lot of health policy is considered and the social, social determinants of health are pretty well embedded now in our health policy nationally and internationally. And um, you're probably aware that that's about the way we, where we live, our, our life chances in terms of poverty, education, environment, housing, etc., and how that impacts on our health and well-being over the life, life course. Um, so I think aligning our report with that policy sort of way of thinking was, was helpful. Um, there is a chapter on considering the evidence, which looks very much about the, at the types of methodologies that are used in this sector, qualitative and quantitative. But it really, in the end, comes down with, on the side of a kind of realist approach. Now, I'm absolutely not an expert in, in evidence, so I only sort of vaguely grasp all these things. But I think that we talk about what works for whom and in what circumstances. And I think that does mirror um, what Nancy's been saying. I did actually go to a lecture by Ray Pawson on evidence-based medicine and evidence-based policy in that period. And he calls for a realist evaluation around this sort of work and saying that um, he thinks the best way to approach it is, um, is evidence-informed policy. It reflects better what actually happens than the idea of evidence-based policy. Uh, our report says, and this is in a sense challenging what Nancy's been saying, but I'd be interested to see how your, what your response is, is that more than an evidence base, policy making and commissioning is underwritten by a belief system. Um, and this does reflect some research that I was reading up in, re in preparing for this by Paul Kearney and Catherine Oliver in the uh, Health Research Policy and Systems Journal in 2017, which argues that researchers should take on board more persuasion techniques because you're challenging belief systems uh, sometimes and that you need to adapt to different ways of thinking about policy making systems. They, they highlight this idea that academics will be challenged by the ethics of what is often seen as PR and I think the, the relationship between evidence and PR is a really interesting area um, and in fact in their, in their um, article they say um, uh, their phrase is, sorry, I've written it down somewhere here, um, to quote, manipulative emotional appeals. <laughs> They're recommending researchers use manipulative emotional appeals. I took offence at that. I don't think that um, when we get into our advocacy and PR hats, we're necessarily doing it in a very... Um, it sounds evil, that's all, that sort of notion of being manipulative, but maybe, maybe that's what we are doing. Um, and accepting co-production. Now, I think this is quite interesting. So the idea that policy should be actually developed by service users, by local groups, by... Um, deliverers of the services. And this is an area I, I would also welcome all your views on because in England there is a huge emphasis now on place-based policy. Uh, and this is around the notion of a locality, whatever that might be, it might be a city, it might be a county, it might be, in the case of the health service, what's called a sustainability and transformation partnership or integrated care system, which may be a slightly bigger territory, and that's about logistics and practicality. But the point of it is it's integrating at the level at which people receive the services, and it's sharing budgets, theoretically, and it's working on a population's needs. Now, what I have experienced in my practice life is very often people at a place level saying, we're not interested in the evidence from down the road or up the country. What's happening here? We want the evidence of what's going on here. And I think that is a real challenge because that transfer of national level evidence base into practice has to go through that sort of operational localised thinking and commissioning. Often that's where a lot of the power is in terms of decision making and commissioning. Um, how long have I... I don't know. <laughs> um, so... 
Anyway, so the other thing that was really struck me in this time was listening to a talk by uh, Matthew Taylor, who is the director of the Royal Society of Arts and used to be director of the Institute for Public Policy Research and was an advisor to the Prime Minister. And he was talking about the importance of a fertile public ground for policy and that he used the smoking ban as an example. He said, policy can fall on stony ground and it just doesn't work. But if you have a receptive public, then your policy can really take off quickly. And you can see change happen very quickly. Now, this is, I think, a very 360-degree space. It's not linear. It's not like one thing leads to another. It is very hard to understand what the dynamic is between these things. But that notion of, of public being ready for it, I really sort of took on board. And I have to say that in England, since the publication of our report, it has felt like our report has landed on very fertile territory. I don't quite know what's going on, but it's extraordinary the, the, the way things are shifting. And to my mind, 10 years ago, there was a headline on the Sun newspaper, which was taking the Picasso. And that was about a sculpture outside a hospital and the waste of NHS money on using the arts in a hospital environment. Ten days ago, there was a headline on the front of the Daily Mail, which f some of you will know is even more significant than the sun, and it said, dance lessons on the NHS for, uh, this was around loneliness, dance lessons for the lonely on the NHS, and it was a positive article, and I was like, <laughs> because I sometimes think the government is more swayed by Daily Mail evidence than any other, <laughs> than any other evidence. So, um, the What Works Centre for Wellbeing has been involved in the loneliness strategy. It's very interesting that um, Nancy says that the evidence around the impact of interventions is weak. But that national strategy, which has had a lot of attention, to my mind, it's got to where it's got to because of campaigning. Now, the Campaign to End Loneliness and the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission, uh, uh, which happened after the death, the murder of the MP Joe Cox, must be based on evidence that I know the man, one of the men who founded the campaign to end loneliness, Paul Can, who used to run Age UK in Oxfordshire, and he certainly would have been somebody, even if the evidence wasn't academic evidence, it would have been based on his life's experience of working with older people. So he would have known that loneliness was a key issue, in, and so he campaigned about it. And that has had a powerful influence and led to a minister for loneliness and a national strategy on loneliness. And the What Works Centre for Wellbeing did a quick review in that process of the evidence base. So I don't know what I'm saying, except that it seems to me quite a complex um, process by which uh, policy is um, related to evidence. And then I think the other thing that's really interesting is how do you make it work in practice and what is that process from policy evidence and policy into practice because I think practitioners will look at evidence aside from policy you know they aren't necessarily it's not again it's not linear so <laughs> that's all I've got to say at the moment but I'll contribute to the questions if I can Right. Um, so um, I'll be talking about uh, Arts Equal Research Initiative uh, uh, and particularly research-based policy recommendations and how they have been used to inform policy making in the past couple of years. Um, the Arts Equal Research Initiative is a, is a six-year multidisciplinary research project coordinated by the Uni University of the Arts Helsinki. Uh, its consortium partners include University of Turku, Laperant University of Technology, Cooper Center for Cultural Policy Research, and Finnish Institute of Occupational Health. As one of uh, the most extensive res researches into arts and art education in Finland's history, Arts Equal understands arts... Whoa, jumping. There is my mouse. Okay. Uh, 
Article understands arts as basic service, uh, which needs to be available to all people and enhance well-being, well-being on a wide range of life domains. With close to 100 researchers and over 50 <coughs> interaction partners, Article has investigated the arts and arts education in a number of contexts, including arts organizations, schools, the basic arts education system, elder care, youth work, prisons, refugee work, disability services, and so on. Um, by understanding the state-funded services in the arts as public service, Arts Equal asks, what mechanisms in Finnish basic services in arts and arts education sustain unequal participation? And assuming equality as the starting point, uh, how should practices in basic services in arts and arts education be changed? In addition, the project investigates the benefits of participatory arts for well-being at large. We also explore how the arts and arts education can be theorized from a wider societal significance perspective towards creating equality. What political and policy consequences arise from such a shift of perspective. Now, Arts Equal is funded by the Academy of Finland Strategic Research Council. We are part of its Equal Society program. Um, and and this relatively new funding scheme, um, research is uh, demand-driven and solution-oriented. The main review criteria are uh, societal relevance and impact as well as scientific quality. Um, so um, the government of Finland has defined strategic research uh, uh, in this context. Uh, it refers to long-term problem-focused and high-quality research that informs public policy and the de development of societal activities and, and that ultimately is aimed at finding solutions to the challenges and problems facing society. Um, therefore, the selected research consortia are expected to collaborate with potential end-users of knowledge uh, from the very beginning. And for this reason, Article has an interaction plan that involves more than 50 interaction partners, such as the Minister of Education and Culture, the Minister of Social Affairs and Health, the Arts Promotion Center of Finland, Finnish National uh, uh, Agency for Education, uh, the Association of Finnish Local and Regional Authorities, Regional State Administrative Agencies, numerous cities, NGOs, arts organizations, schools, and research institutions. As part of our societal interaction, our research dissemination activities include participation in international conferences, research publications, obviously, both scientific and popularized. Uh, we uh, uh, organize learning jams for targeted interaction partners such as municipalities or professionals in basic art education. We uh, organize panel discussions, studio generally lectures, seminars and symposiums. Much of our interaction activities have to do with learning, especially collaborative learning, bringing people together to discuss on selected topics and introducing research-based ideas into the discussions. We're also planning a, we were also planning a roadshow to all regions of Finland, but that was omitted as the budget, budgets of all the SRC consortia were cut with 30% for the second part that runs from 2018 until April 21. Uh, now, just very briefly about some of the results regarding our research dissemination and societal interaction. Uh, these figures here are a bit old, I'm afraid. Uh, we are currently putting together the new report, but it won't be ready before the end of November. So anyway, uh, our original research plan, we est estimated modestly to publish about 20 peer-reviewed articles in six years. After two years, we had published about 43 peer-reviewed articles, and in addition, 52 popularized publications. And by the end of uh, last year, uh, 17, we had more than tripled the results with 143 peer-reviewed articles and, 2000, and 201 popularized publications. Uh, the popularized publications include also uh, approximately 60 video lectures available online on our website. And by the end of 2017, they had been viewed more than 10,000 times. Uh, with our interaction activities, we had reached uh, academics, practitioners, civil servants, and decision makers in 21 municipalities and their surrounding regions, more or less across the country. Um, but if we take into consideration the live streaming of many of our events, then we have reached way beyond, beyond these, these 21 municipalities, obviously. Uh, we have reached people of all ages and from all ranges of social groups, uh, from, a, from a range of, of, of social groups, as you can see here. 
there are uh, immigrant groups, uh, refugee groups, people with mental health problems, uh, young families, uh, students, um, prisoners, uh, people with disabilities, and other groups. Um, and in two years, we had organized 26 events with close to 800 participants, these including, for example, the, the, the learning jams that I mentioned. And, and we had about, uh, uh, also we had had about 60 media interviews and other media exposure. And by 2017, we had about 142 media interviews and 32 other media exposures. So, so in general, this is a sort of a, sort of a expanding, uh, expanding project. We also, from, from the very beginning, started to use social media as a strategic means of communication. Uh, and by the end of 2017, we had reached about 200,000 people through Twitter and almost 250,000 people through Facebook. In addition, those 80,000 visitors on our website and our Equally Well blog. Um, to, il to, inform, uh, to help inform decision making at national, regional, and local levels, us equal and other research consortia in the uh, SRC programs are expected to produce not only high quality research articles but also policy recommendations. Uh, to make an impact, such recommendations need to come out, of, out at the right time and they need to be taken into consideration in public debates that prepare ground for decision making. Uh, insofar, Article has produced eight research-based policy briefs, as seen here. They uh, address range of societal topics from cultural rights in healthcare and social services to the expansion of the percent, the percent for art principle, from comprehensive schools as Finland's largest cultural center to accessibility as the premise for basic arts education, and from art for well-being at work to arts against loneliness more generally in society. Uh, today I'll focus on, on two of these policy briefs, one that focuses on cultural rights in health, uh, healthcare and social services, and the other that deals with expansion of the percentage principle. Now, uh, a growing body of research points uh, the benefits of the arts on health and well-being. Uh, in Finland in 2010, drawing from such research literature, a minister, ministerial task force produced an action program suggesting that preventing health and social problems with active engagement in the arts and culture can have positive economic effects in terms of lower health and social care costs and higher productivity in the national economy. Uh, consequently, numerous participatory arts projects have been introduced in a range of contexts, including elder care, youth work, and work with refugees. Um, yet at present, well-being through the arts and arts education are not equally available to all people in Finland. And, uh, and services in the arts and arts education are often designed with the preconception that the participants are capable to actively find their way to such services. This, preconcep this preconception excludes many people, <clears throat> for example, prisoners, people in elderly homes and long-term hospital patients who cannot participate in the arts due to their present situation. In reference to these people, cultural rights uh, Cultural rights occur randomly, if at all, because the public funding of the arts and arts education does not entail detailed demands on, or incentives uh, on equal access. Other, mechanis other mechanisms of inequality uh, that make the arts inaccessible for some groups include physical distance and other obstructions, economic hardship, inadequate cultural and social capital, lack of rapport, and uh, elitist arts venues. Uh, now, Finland is a post-expansive Nordic welfare state struggling with a growing sustainability gap due to its aging population, low birth rates, social exclusion of young people, and unsuccessful, unsuccessful integration of immigrants. Such challenges have brought about a national health, social services, and regional government reform, which entails that the responsibility to organize health and social services will be transferred from municipalities to 18 counties from I think 15 actually, counties from 1st January 2020. At present, hastily law drafting is going and the parliament will decide on the continu continuation of the reform this autumn. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about austerity and the end of the welfare state expansion in Finland, and uh, such discussion has grown especially since the onset of the financial crisis and the euro crisis that followed it. Um, and, and, and as it happens, uh, this ongoing reform has opened up a window of opportunity for the arts sector to provide arts-based services into uh, health and social care contexts. 
Uh, and this is sort of remarkable because arts have been historically regarded as a central condition uh, uh, in, in the country's history and identity for, for, for um, especially for our sort of national identity. Now, uh, hence drawing from the Finnish constitution in the two arts equally policy briefs, we argue uh, as follows. Uh, we argue for uh, people's right to participate in the arts and culture and to develop themselves and their communities. We regard that as basic cultural human rights that needs to be secured for all people to learn, participate in culture, and express themselves in all their life stages and situations. Um, and uh, uh, as uh, these excerpts here show, both uh, these are from two different policy documents, uh, policy briefs. Uh, both policy, policy briefs strive to boost cultural well-being through the realization of cultural rights. The policy briefs aim to overcome some of the aforementioned mechanisms of inequality by suggesting that arts and cultural services and, in consequence, cultural well-being can be made accessible for more people by integrating arts and cultural services into health and social care contexts. Um, Um, this one it is. Now here, um, the measures in the first policy brief that we propose for, uh, for the counties uh, include that uh, an action plan for cultural rights and cultural well-being and the monitoring that, uh, of the enactment of the plan and the level of cultural well-being will be implemented in, in, in the counties. Um, uh, we propose that uh, professionally organized artistic and cultural activities are introduced into social and health care structures to build up well-being and prevent social exclusion in a sustainable way. We also propose that culture-based methods are introduced as part of re rehabilitative approach, but we also underscore that rehabilitation should not be the only grounds for organizing art and cultural activities in social and health care units because uh, cultural rights and cultural well-being needs to be, uh, uh, well, cultural rights needs to be, needs to be, or the realization of cultural rights needs to be acknowledged, really. And that, that uh, and, and this is sort of our core point that uh, in, 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 in the reform uh, is that cultural rights and cultural well-being need to be acknowledged in the quality criteria for social and healthcare service providers when the regions are negotiating with the service providers. And if we get this into the contracts, then it's, it's, it's actually, then we have, we have actually accomplished something. We just need two words into the contracts, cultural well-being, mm -hmm. as a quality criteria. Uh, expansion of the percentage for the art principle. This is our second policy brief. Uh, um, the, the percent for art principle has traditionally meant uh, the operating and financial model where a share from construction costs is spent on art investments. Uh, this is nothing uh, new. It came to, this idea came to Finland from Central Europe uh, in the 1930s, and by 1980s, uh, many municipalities had agreed to use this idea in their building projects. Um, now, drawing from the constitutional premise uh, of cultural rights, uh, in article we claim that 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 uh, that uh, this percent for art principle should be expanded so that a particular share. Of, of operation costs in health and social uh, care organizations could be uh, used for, especially for participatory arts uh, services. And, and, and we have now, uh, with uh, social interaction with our key stakeholders, that's uh, in, in an interministerial Title II task force, uh, it's, it's organized by the Ministry of Education and Culture and the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health, we have succeeded in actually bringing these ideas into a, a sort of a um, list of recommendations for the change directors in the regions who will then go and implement this new reform when, when the reform comes into force. Um, so, so we have actually managed to get the, the two ministries to stand behind our recommendations and um, that's a sort of a, not an impact yet, but I would say that is an outcome. Um, 
and that um, these ideas have also been included in the new uh, um, report that just came out from another ministerial task force on the key objectives for Finland's new art and artist policy. So, uh, so in that way, that again is an outcome, even if not yet an actual impact out in the field. Um, also, these ideas have been included in the revision of the Municipal Activities Act. So we have actually been able to, to impact uh, the lawmaking and, and there, hopefully, there will be uh, genuine impacts in due course when the new act comes into force 2019. Insofar in the regions, we have reached three regions, Pirkama here in the Tampere area, Etla Sava in, in, uh, towards eastern Finland, and Varsana Suomi in southwest Finland. Um, where ideas, our policy briefs have been taken into consideration as the regions have prepared their regional plans for well-being. Uh, here in Pirkanmaa, they are already in, in force and, and are being uh, actively used, whereas as Etla Savo is still working on them. And Varsana Suomi actually organized a, 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 a task force to work on this, and they have now agreed that that cultural well-being will be actually one of the key drivers for the region uh, for the future, and that's quite remarkable as well. So there, I would say we are we are uh, again we have an outcome, even if we wait to see the impacts uh, at an individual level of of the residents in the region. Um, one of the outcomes is also keeping a journal that the University of Turku is publishing now. Uh, it's a sort of a low threshold, uh, popularized journal on arts and well-being, uh, something that we have never had, we haven't had in Finland before, and 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 it's something that the, the decision decision makers and also civil servants need. I mean, as as you were mentioning that that. Um, uh, the the easy, easy, easy access of information is crucial, and, and, and that's what we try to do with, with this particular journal. That's more or less what I had to say on this one. Thank you. questions and then open the floor. Can I just ask, have we got a printed copy of them? My computer died and the plug doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got them on, on the... My screen's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, thank you. My, yeah, my That's five right. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as a kind of procedural question, but, uh, there's quite a bit of questions, so... Quite a lot, so... Um, so, how about if we just go through them and then open the... Uh, uh, have the floor asking questions as we go along, so we don't worry about... So we could do it by area, because there are five areas, yeah. aren't there? So let's I, do it by area. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, many thanks, and of course you, you answered quite a good, and gave good, good examples of many of our questions. Uh, but um, so, so we had very interesting, uh, pretty concrete examples of, of, of cases in which uh, evidence have actually managed in supporting decisions, at least in terms of, well, uh, outcomes, if not yet in impacts. Um, uh, so, so I move on to directly the, the main drivers, of course. N N Nancy pretty much uh, already gave a very polished framework for thinking about it, but I'd like to hear more from, from Alex and Kai about uh, what are the, what do you, have you, in your experience, have been the main, main drivers for actually uh, making, making evidence count? Uh, uh, Alex, you mentioned something. You mentioned uh, the importance of the fertility of the ground and also stressed the, the, the kind of um, contingency and path dependence of these processes. But, uh, but uh, could you tell us a bit more about? Well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that it feels to me 
that a lot of different bits of the jigsaw have to be in place and that in all of the a lot of us are, are guilty of focusing on what we're interested in and i do think we we need to function within the space where we have influence and we can't spend our whole time worrying about all the bits we can't influence but um you know unless you've got the whole cycle of how it will fall on the you know how it will be received how it will be implemented uh then it it's a perfect policy is is slightly pointless so um i think that is my experience but it's also where i come from i come from a more organic arts-based way of doing things so i don't think in terms of you know getting this bit right and then it influencing this bit i think that my experience is that that it's a very integrated process and a lot of players who have different agendas and different voices have to be in the conversation for it to be effective just a couple of points from listening to the other th in, in relation to that. So one, I would very much endorse the word evidence-informed rather than evidence-based. So it's not a question of saying, I have the answer, why aren't you idiots doing it? It's how can evidence play a part in informing decision-making? Decisions will get made regardless. Politics and evidence have very different pace and politics is essentially problem solving. So when that issue comes into the spotlight, which is the politics, the social value, the fertile ground, is the evidence ready to be engaged? And that um, way of being ready when the time is right and the different types of influencing that can happen is quite important to think about. But I mean, the pace and the politics mean that there's a whole load of stuff we don't know, that things can be unpalatable and unworkable, but decisions will be made regardless, and you want them to be made on the best available evidence. And if we don't know, then we should say that we don't know. And that's been one of our strengths, I think, is that we've said, actually, nobody knows the answer to this yet. Not that it doesn't work or not, but no one's looked at it yet. And often with the good things, the things we think are just good for people, we haven't researched or haven't been as researched and in as much detail as things that are deficits. So I think that would be my, um, I mean, decisions will be made regardless. How can you make sure evidence is going to get there as quickly as possible at the right time? Uh, I fully agree uh, with what you just said. Uh, topicality, uh, I think that's, that's, that's crucial. It was uh, Professor Yuho Sari here from, from University of Tampere joined us for, uh, for a seminar um, last week, and he underscored the importance of heating what is already warm. Hmm. He said, don't, don't even think of trying to heat something that's cold. That will, that will never work. Heat something that's already warm uh, so that, that, that the discussion needs to be happening already, and then you connect with, with policy recommendations. Uh, from my experience, stakeholder consensus is quite crucial as well. Uh, if there is no consensus with stakeholders, or if you have sort of uh, excluded some of the key stakeholders from the process, it can really backfire. Uh, so, uh, so that we, we learned uh, the lesson the wrong way, and, and it took us a really long time to, to get one of, the, one of our key stakeholders, uh, not decision makers, uh, not civil servants, but uh, a sort of a national NGO uh, representing basic arts education in Finland, uh, getting them to, uh, they misunderstood our research and our, our recommendations when we were talking about equality and they felt that we are trying to demolish the whole basic arts educational system. It really backfired because then the rumors start going and the rumors go fast and, and it just takes so much time to, to put down the fire. Mm. Had we engaged them from the beginning in the right way so that they had known what we were talking about, we would not have had that issue. I wondered if we could just focus briefly on loneliness. I think it's a really interesting case study because I don't know the history of how we've got to where we've got to. I saw it was one of your um, policy briefings as well. But there was a key piece of research which was it's, more, it's worse for your health than smoking 10 cigarettes, cigarettes a day to be lonely. Now, somehow that got into the public consciousness. I'm sure it influenced the process. It's been quoted endlessly. 
then I've heard doctors say a third of our patients um, arriving at the surgery are there really because of loneliness, whether that's from social isolation or disability or long-term conditions or whatever. So there's a sort of popular concept, and then the word itself is very easy for people to latch on to. It's not complex policy wording, it's not jargon, it's like everyone knows what loneliness is. It's, it's simplistic, I'm sure, in terms of what we're dealing with. <laughs> But it seems to me to have been an interesting process that's moved quite fast. I wondered, do you, would you agree, Nancy? So I think if, if you, the campaigners in the field will probably say it hasn't moved that fast, but it's suddenly one of those ones that had a fur target. I mean, it, it's done in the wake of Joe Cox's murder. So that was a cross-party area where everyone was going to say yes, I think. So that was one of the things where you can't really say no in the wake. It, was, it seems like a good thing, right? It's not been that necessarily easy because loneliness like love or um, beauty and things like that don't often appear in policy documents <laughs> and actually that's been I mean actually the word beauty recently appeared in an environment department for environment policy document which was one of my goals um, <laughs> uh, I, I think no so yes heating things that are already warm but there are ways to help things warm um, and knowing which stage you're at is really helpful um, so knowing whether you're trying to <laughs> make things bubble over and get going uh, loneliness um, a really interesting one so uh, I think the question there was about whether it was a suitable topic for policy government and policy because it's quite a personal thing so why should government be involved with it and it, I think it's not something traditionally our politics has been involved with. I, so I think that was quite a unique one. Mm. But I think the campaigners probably spent quite a long time, and the researchers likewise, have spent quite a long time ploughing on with their field, and then they had to be ready to catch that wave when it came. Mm. Hi. Th thanks for it. Is that working? It should, should be. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's working now. Um, I, I would really take issue with the notion that you should only heat what's already warm because I think you run, as researchers, into a real danger of kind of um, evidence-based or evidence-informed policy becoming um, policy-based evidence in that researchers become entirely reactive to, to the, the, the current dilemmas of ministers and policy makers that they invented in their bathroom mirrors that morning. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of... And I think we have a greater social responsibility as academics from that. I think the... And what I'd be really interested in hearing your views on is the way in which kind of um, people as, as, as researchers can start to think about the possible kind of policy relevance of what they're doing and how they go about creating and engendering that fertile ground to actually make sure that, that the sorts of stuff they're doing has that kind of positive beneficial outcome. Everyone's sort of sitting back. I'm not a researcher, so I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. So one of the things that I've noticed is the type, valuing the type, different types of research being valued. So actually, it was really interesting to hear your project, because actually it was quite an applied piece of research. So if we think about good policy making as politics, evidence and delivery, there's a whole load of evidence generation that has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with how we do things, and that's fine and that's right. Um, but some of it will go into campaigning and understanding the public, uh, used in advocacy, not necessarily by the academics themselves, but by campaign organisations, and that, that's great, and that's like you've mentioned a couple of examples. I get a little sceptical with some of these... Uh, advocacy research which is like I've done a survey of our workforce 10% of people responded they've all got mental health problems therefore mental health is a massive issue um, so I don't like those I, so I tend to be a bit cautious and I think as a policymaker, you're also quite cautious of that um, I think knowing being able to communicate your findings yeah. so I think the real value academics have is in being robust and rigorous and unbiased in what they do and that is their strength and playing to your strength is really cool and there's a whole load of skill set I mean 
I don't do the meta-analysis. I, I understand how meta-analysis is done, and, but actually the skill of doing a meta-analysis is quite different sometimes from communicating it. And some academics can do it very well and some don't. And so knowing your strengths is probably my first one, but also knowing the type of research you do and where that fits in the system. So you're not trying to get disproportionate so one of the things I've noticed with the change in the UK around impact is that you've got a very tiny niche piece of research and you're trying to get the whole system to swing around something, I don't know, about microbiology in the gut or something, where actually it needs to fit into a wider body and that works well. So knowing where you fit and where your type of research fits is quite helpful. But also the type of research that's done. So I wanted to see greater incentive on this evidence that's... Um, very relevant and useful and applied in practice. So the, the evidence and delivery bit of research rather than the evidence and politics bit of research. So I was, we do a lot of work around wellbeing at workplace. And I mean, how much money do companies spend changing the layout of their office, changing the way they hire people, changing, I don't know, the company's system? Do they ever look at the impact that that has on their staff. Well, they do, but they very rarely look at it in a rigorous way or in ways that they can approve it or in ways that can... So the, the evidence base in that area is incredibly weak. Not to say that we don't know the answers necessarily, but that we haven't looked. And so that type of research, looking at what's actually happening already, would be really... It's why I quite liked yours, looking at the, 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 the area there. So that valuing that type of research is also the other thing I wanted to say. But my, my big message on that question was play to your strengths and know what they are. <laughs> I, I'd quite like to just say um, one thing that struck me in, our, in the area I've been working is how challenging the whole notion of interdisciplinary research is. And particularly, I was struck struck by a welcome funder who was saying how difficult it is for them to fund interdisciplinary research because all of the systems for um, deciding on funding, prioritizing funding, are based on peer review and that's based on the experience the researchers have and, the, and therefore it's naturally conservative in its... So I think uh, in the UK we've probably made some advances on that front because all the research councils have come together into UKRI which means that there are now cross council calls um, and there's been a recent one around mental health for instance which a, one big um, grant has gone to University College London for, with academics that I know quite well and that is around uh, community interventions and the impact on mental health, including arts and culture, but also community groups and sort of asset-based community development and how that supports mental health. So um, I'd be interested to know what you think about that as researchers, how, it, you know, I, I think that I'm sure there are pros and cons around the whole interdisciplinary um, debate, but it does seem to be the direction of travel. Does that have any relevance to how you focus your research? You're asking the right person with me in that I'm director of new social research, which is a dedicated interdisciplinary research kind of um, program. But it, it is kind of, um, and we're trying very hard here at, at Tempera to, to, to foster that kind of development. In fact, this seminar series is a product of academics working in quite quite different areas, kind of coming together and thinking about this. So um, it's a problem, and I agree, it's a problem with the way in which funding is set up as well. And um, I'm, I'm not so confident about uh, UKRI and, and how it'll do that. Um, and I think it's also, it's, it's problematic for a lot of academic researchers, particularly in the UK, and I am British, um, that uh, the, the mechanisms for evaluating people's research performance and therefore their promotion and whether they get included in the REF and so on are all predicated on quite, dis quite narrow disciplinary-based subject work and publishing peer-reviewed academic articles, which, of course, have extremely limited kind of... Um, impact in terms of actually making things happen and we're not terribly good I think academic communities and I think probably the same applies in Finland in terms of encouraging the 
kinds of working that you're talking about now. I think when, when people do it, people like Norma and so on, and very, very committed to it, and Salah as well, um, you know, pe people do it because of kind of real personal commitment. But I, I don't know, we're, one of the things we're struggling with is how we kind of almost institutionalise this as part of the professional practice of being an academic researcher. So it's, it's part of the job and it's recognised as part of the job and it's funded appropriately and rewarded appropriately. That's, but they're huge problems. <laughs> can, I, can I go back a bit? Thank you for your... I want to go back a little bit uh, to what you said earlier. Uh, thank you for your comment about the danger in warming what is already hot. Uh, I fully agree with you on that. Um, and, and sort of a... For that not to happen requires critical self-reflection from from uh, our side as academics to to ensure that 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 uh, we don't turn turn research into policy based policy based research. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, when we uh, copyrighted to me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> That's a very used, it's yeah. a very well used term. Like evidence based it's, it's, policy is policy based yeah, evidence. Policy -based, yeah. Yeah. But, so I would have called it policy relevant, rather like policy, policy evidence informed. That's good. That's a good policy one. Relevant. Policy relevant. That's very good. Policy relevant. I have to keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> policy relevant. Uh, anyway, but I was just you know, when I'm when I was sort of referring to what you Hasari was discussing about uh, in our seminar, uh, I, I do agree with him that that sort of government strategy directs key decision making, and in, in that sense. If you can hook into those themes and discussions, you have better chances to get your message across. Even if, if your ideas, if you're, even if your idea is uh, sort of to introduce entirely new new ideas that are worthy to consider in policy making, I think this is especially true if you wish to get engaged in transprofessional task forces that prepare policies for ministries and regions. Uh, it is those themes for such task forces come from. From, from government strategies or regional strategies, and, and therefore it is already cooking, sort of. They don't, they don't sort of grow in a, in a vacuum, but, but when, when such, such task forces are being sort of uh, launched and people are invited to join, uh, discussion has been going on for a while already. And, and in that sense, I think that's a, a sort of a sneaking into the system through the kitchen and then start cooking with your <laughs> own pots and pans rather than sort of... Uh... Start warming yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> of it work, yeah. <laughs> so um, my question is about um, values, because you, you, you mentioned that, and I think it's very important also to kind of always bring us back to politics as uh, discussion and decision making on good society and values that underpin that. And I think this move towards evidence-based policies kind of trying to maybe fool us into thinking that policy is just about kind of research-based uh, evidence. So, okay, so my question is about the role of philosophers and kind of people doing um, non-empirical work and their, in their possibilities to influence exactly this kind of value basis of decision making. How do they get into the kitchen? With what evidence and with what credentials? Maybe even Jakko could answer that question, <laughs> please. Can I answer to that? I love your question. Thank you for that. It's it's it's. it's uh there is so much discussion about sort of uh, empirical evidence. Uh, I'm, I'm so tired of all that. Uh, I think philosophers can contribute to uh, policy processes with new sort of a new insights, new ways of thinking, new theoretical sort of uh, articulations uh, by introducing entirely new concepts that open up our way of thinking from a new perspective. Uh, it's, uh, there is so much that 
uh, that sort of philosophical or theor theoretical thinking can can bring into uh, policy debates, uh, and and I think we are as academics uh, sort of working in that boundary area between sort of research and policy making. Uh, we are often too stuck to to at least right now there is a lot of discussion on 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 evidence and empirical evidence and we often forget that that there is much more than than academics can bring into the into the tables so definitely i think it's just that 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 there needs to be a bridge between sort of philosophical ideas and and their their usefulness in real life that 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 bridge is needed <laughs> Uh, in a way, the, the experience I've had that most uh, shows the influence of philosophy most is within medical education and medical humanities. And I think, um, you know, my, my first thought is education is where all this starts, all the, the people you're producing from the university who will go out there into the world, and that it's in this space that you really need to crack that issue of how values meet reality, as it were, and... Um, and then, then hopefully that will will take our young people forward with a different way of thinking about things. But it is very striking that the conclusions of our inquiry were, were that the the biggest issue is culture change, and of course, culture change is all about belief systems and values, and and. Uh, we have all sorts of strategies around that, but that is driven by us believing that what we've got to say is a value, uh, and um, that in itself is a belief, belief system, obviously. I think this is a really interesting area. So I'm going to come at it slightly differently. So uh, philosophy, there's quite a lot of philosophers active in well-being in a very public engagement way, actually. There's a whole movement around stoicism. There's a whole movement around... Um, well, all different types of philosophy as a, a way of finding meaning in the world, and which is slightly different, I suspect, from what you're thinking about. But very, that's very popular facing. I mean, these websites and Twitter feeds are uh, very well used and actually are rigorously thought of. Um, and actually are really insightful and help provoke thought. There's also a whole stream of work around values. Um, the, the, the World Values Survey um, is one that I think is particularly interesting in the context of well-being. Um, and people have been studying for some time, actually. But I suspect that's not what you're thinking about. Um, and again, I think this is where thinking about evidence quite broadly is really valuable. So I've talked quite a little, lot about what works type of evidence, like what works for whom, when, why, how, and for how much, which is quite a practical question. Um, where actually, I, I mean, decisions are being made all the time and you'd quite want them to be informed by evidence and the evidence needs a certain type of thinking. But there are other ones that are quite useful. Um, and I think understanding and being able to communicate your ideas well is always a good start. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm suspecting that you're coming at it from a slightly different way. I think philosophy itself has had a quite a big impact on well-being as a, mm. as a public concept. Mm. And public engagement in that is not lacking. Um, and if anything, it's growing further and it's, it's, it's a different stage. And we can now test some of those ideas empirically as it takes us further on. Um, how you make meaning and things like that. Yeah, I think I have to respond as a philosopher for the, to this. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I also do, uh, I'm quite optimistic that there's quite a lot of work to do with philosophers in this kind of science policy interface arena. Uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd caution the, I mean, pro probably one, one of the kind of ideas that comes to mind first as a kind of philosopher and science and values is the, as a philosopher, as a kind of modern day secular priest who is come to tell you what's wrong and what's right. <laughs> and I think that that's absolutely the wrong model of thinking about it. But, but as, as Kai said, I think the, the, the role is more in terms of like clearing up concepts uh, and kind of, uh, Ex making explicit certain kinds of ways of thinking about how values and, and like evidence go together in a more pro in a broader sense. So, 
Um, Alex, you mentioned several times the belief systems, and I completely agree that those exist uh, for these different stakeholders and actors. And so then that makes me think that the question is how can we make these different actors and stakeholders recognize and see their different belief systems and, and how those influence their efforts to try to translate um, evidence to practice and policy. And then that relates back to, Nancy, your presentation where you went through these different mechanisms and uh, this number four I was really interested in, which was the interaction between decision makers and researchers. And you noted that that's really um, expensive, it's not cost effective, it's, it's difficult. And I would argue that it would be great to come up with sort of cheaper ways to promote that because the number four is also connected to, for instance, number three and number six, which were the visible evidence through access and communication. Because if researchers understand the decision makers, then they will see value in trying to make their evidence more understandable. And then if decision makers, again, if there's more interaction and understanding between them, then that will benefit the um, adoption through decision-making structures and processes. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? That is quite insightful, very quick <laughs> pick up of those. Um, the, so one of the things that I noticed from the evidence review is that actually the, the, the most effective use of those mechanisms is in combination. Um, which is you've picked up already. That interaction with decision makers and research, researchers is, um, I suspect, expensive because the time of an individual and commitment required to come to an event is quite high. Um, uh, and you can bring down that cost by live streaming, by providing video lectures, that is re and, and online courses based on those. I mean, like reusing the content brings the cost right down, like cost effectiveness per person right down, which is brilliant, which is why e-learning is surprisingly cost effective. Even though people don't really like it, it's really quite effective for some things. So, for example, with policy professionals uh, in the civil service, we worked out that they really liked getting together um, but they didn't turn up at things. Mm. Really frustrating, right? So we worked out that when, if you were going to get them together, they needed a lot of content really quickly and an emphasis on networks. So encouraging them. So the format that we got them together, we worked quite hard on and did lots of evaluation on to really get that right. Um, what got them to show up? What got them to get the highest impact and highest value of it? What got them returning? Um, when could you use information-based things and e-learning? So that was a way of getting it, that cost down. But then you talked about making things visible and getting things into systems, and that's very clever as well. So how can you systematize this? Health has done this really spectacularly, actually. So there's a whole... The evidence culture around health is just so different to social policy. And part of the reason for that is that you get practitioners who are also researchers. People move in and out of those professions, and it's quite normal to do that. Um, and you don't want that everywhere. But there's the interesting innovation... I mean, the UK have got long had research hospitals. We've now got this thing called the Research Schools Network which are a number of 10 schools across the UK, across different parts of the country, England actually, not UK, uh, who are research schools, exactly that, and their job is to take research out to their peers, which is again about this belief system. You hear, It's like also your messenger. Like if somebody tells you something from your side of the political debate, you're much more likely to understand it, and there's some empirical evidence around that as well. But yeah, getting those systems and processes right. So one of the things we did in the policy profession is we introduced a master's in public policy with the London School of Economics to increase that for, for senior level researchers. So again, that professionalism drive, and I was struck by the conversation about the professionalism drive for academics, about the type of work that they should do and, and what that they, there's a passion, internal passion that they bring with them. So I think there's certainly ways we could improve the cost effectiveness around all of those types of things. I also suspect that relationship between academics and um, officials is a a longer term thing rather than an immediate term thing. Um, one of the things that we worked on in the UK in the open policy making unit 
and the what work centres do this to, to a degree, is there's a bridge between them. So when you're suddenly asked by the minister, we're going to focus on loneliness, and you go, oh my God, who are the academics who work on this? And you go to them and they go, ah, oh, this is the network. And sometimes those networks already exist in the academic world that are really quite good, and you just find that one researcher and they just open the door. Sometimes you have to know quite a large number, particularly when it's multidisciplinary. And if there's an organisation that can help you do that, that's really helpful. Um, and sometimes that will be, and that's about the social capital within mm. that and measuring and valuing that social capital. Yes, I would say that, valuing that infrastructure. I mean, it sort of goes back to the interdisciplinary question. I think the more co-production, and I would argue that it shouldn't just be researchers and policymakers. I think there should be the voice of, of the service users and other players, the whole, you know, and that's very difficult to achieve. But, you know, in terms of practice, it happens, doesn't it? If you think of multidisciplinary teams in hospitals, for instance, now, which is a relatively recent development where you've got the nurses and the doctors and the other staff working together and talking to each other in their daily practice. I think it's mirroring that through the whole system is what we should all be moving towards, really. Uh, time really flies, but I, I, I'm myself in no hurry to end this, so, so, so that we shouldn't, by accident, end in a positive note. That would be horrible. <laughs> so, so could you share some con concrete, uh, concrete examples on, on, on how, how the use of evidence in, in policy has failed, so how, when, when the clear advice has really fallen on deaf ears? I think Kai, Kai mentioned something in the discussion, but, uh, but uh, Alex and Nancy, could you some, some enlightening examples? The, the, the classic one in the UK is drugs policy. Oh, yes. So there's a, there's a scientific advisory. There was an at-home office appointed scientific advisory group on drugs policy that resigned because their advice was routinely ignored. And the other one most recently was the Commission on Social Mobility uh, as well, where they were just saying, well, the government's just doing so many things that are the opposite. What's the point? Um, and I think there's probably many others where we've also gone ahead and done something where we've completely ignored a whole load of evidence that's happening in academia by accident. So I think there's something about that. Like, we just don't know about it existing, which is a problem about how do you make that more visible? There's a problem about it being unworkable in practice, so like really clever ideas that haven't engaged with the delivery system, which is another reason for failure. The other one is that they're unpalatable mm. politically, um, or that the pace is just wrong. So the evaluation that's taken three years, well, you've had a change of government by that time and the change of political party, and like the political mood is in a completely different place. So there's no point persevering with, I don't know, uh, a particular policy around uh, when, when the mood is not just right. So that's the sort of things that can happen. Um, the, the other, there is there is some research around how you present difficult evidence that's against somebody's beliefs and that is counterculture, which is about how you present it as a not you're doing everything wrong. Look, my research says this, but hmm, we found this. This is odd. Why, why is that happening? Which is a lot less threatening way to do it, um, which I thought was quite... Which is what we probably try and do a lot. So the loneliness bit was, was a bit on that. It was like, well, actually, we looked at this. It wasn't that there was no evidence. There's some, there's no, nobody's looked at whole swathes of it, which is quite interesting. We just don't know. But sometimes we've looked in quite a lot of detail and we've found relatively little impact. And why is that? That's odd. But, and if you're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of enthusiasm, now there's political will, actually, we're going to have to do that in a different way. And, and so, but I mean, people believe what, they, they, they're, they're invested in it. So that's the other thing was about how do you uh, test smaller things that allow things to fail? So if your passion and belief is that the way you're doing, you've invested your whole life in this program, if I then tell you at the end of that program, well, it didn't work. <laughs> Or um, uh, So the example there is around teaching assistants in the UK in schools, where they looked at all the, the similar centre to ours, looked at the evidence base around it, and they said, well, actually, on balance, there's no positive educational benefit to teaching assistants. And that was massively countercultural. Like, what? That seems so wrong. They're a hell of a help to the teachers, I think. <laughs> well, there you go. So my personal experience is this. So what they then did was go, okay, well, that's odd. 
we need to be careful about how we spend that money then because actually it's a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort that people clearly, and the evidence isn't quite right. So what they've gone in and then and gone, well, okay, actually there's quite a lot of variation within the practice. So um, there's a lot of places where teaching assistants make it worse. <laughs> they've not been trained and they're there working with pupils in a way that actually harms their ability to progress and there's some ways that teaching assistants work really well really support the teacher really support specific students and so they focus on how you use teaching assistants which is much easier to fail on if you test it and say well actually we did it in small groups rather than groups of three rather than groups of six that's much easier to fail on than whether teaching assistants as in a whole is, is harder is a good thing or a bad thing so I'm quite an advocate of testing small things so one of the things around local growth training was that training for employment practices really works. And the thing that makes the biggest difference is sending a text message reminder the day before. And you can test that. Do I send it? What time do I start the class? Eight, when they're still asleep? Eleven, when they're awake? Or two, when they're stoned? I mean, like, you can pick your... You can test that. So there's ways of doing evidence that allow people to fail more effectively without the whole life work going under. Can I just throw in something I think you've forgotten, which is lobbying groups mm. and <laughs> capitalism? <laughs> because yeah. we've just had our sports minister resign last night, who was a great... She's a conservative, and I'm not saying anything about my politics, but she was brilliant. And she's resigned because the, um, they've, they've lengthened the time into which they're going to change some gambling rules. And she has experience of working with families whose children have committed suicide, and she's been lobbying for it. And it's about, it's about interest groups and money. And I think, and also I know that the sugar tax failed for the same reasons. You know, it's lobby groups. It's the power of the economy and the power of of business. I would put that in the politics box, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, I'm actually thinking about one of the sort of uh, places where, where evidence has failed in supporting decisions. Uh, that's when uh, there's been over -generali generalizations of research results or, uh, or evidence, such as uh, some of the brain research on connections between music and learning, for example, that then caused a sort of fab, the, the Mozart effect, people thinking that you have to play Mozart, your, 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 your embryo, sort of, sort of in order so sort of that, 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 that sort of stimulates its, its, its brain activities and, and becomes a, and the child then eventually becomes a better learner, which is sort of a, it was, it was based on, on, on sort of a, um, very misunderstood uh, information in newspapers and magazines, and it just spread out massively, and it has now become actually an industry uh, where there are sort of uh, gadgets produced where you can play music to your 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 child in the womb, and that's that's just there is nothing to back up that when you go back into the research and start looking at what, what, it, say, what it actually says there. And then when you, when you start sort of uh, pointing these things out, when researchers start pointing these things out, then the decision makers go like, ah, so you were wrong about this. <laughs> you went out with this information and you were wrong about this. And, uh, and, and that wasn't the case. It was just about that's misinterpreting the, the um, research results and then, then uh, media you know, catching up on that and, and making a big thing out of it. And, and there, I think there are major dangers in, in overgeneralizing, you know, over, making overgeneralizations such as the odds do good for people. No, arts don't always do good for people. There are people going into psychosis because of the arts. You know, it's 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 it can happen. Uh, people can feel hor horrified, depressed afterwards when experiencing some some pieces of art. Not all art are beautiful and happy, happy. So uh, we need to be more sort of uh, down to earth with the claims that we're making. Uh, I think that's actually a nice down-to-earth point to end with because I think we're horribly running out of time. So many thanks for the panelists. I think it's been very successful. Thank you. Thank you.